Hi everybody, we're going to continue reading the 57 bus and just a brief review um, in Sasha's life right now. She has um, been undergoing some painful surgeries as um, doctors are trying to um, put skin from another part of her body onto her badly burnt legs. Um, so painful surgeries and also the support that she's getting um, from her friends and from the community in general. Um, then we're also hearing about Richard's story. Richard is in jail. They have prosecutors are deciding to try Richard as an adult, which means a much heavier sentence. So there's reaction on both sides of that decision to try him as an adult from his parents, people at school, teachers, people that know him um, that are disappointed and shocked. And then there are also those that feel that the injuries that Sasha sustained, maybe this is a fitting um, decision. The first letter, November 8, 2013. Dear victim, I apologize for my actions, for the pain that I brought to you and your family. I was wrong for what I did. I was wrong. I had no reason to do that to you. I don't know what was going through my head at that time. I'm not a monster. I have a big heart. I never even thought of hurting anyone like the way I hurt you. I just wanted you to know that I'm deeply sorry for my actions. I think about what happened every second. I pray that you heal correctly and that you recover and live a happy life. Please forgive me. That's all I want. I take responsibility for all my actions. I'll take all the consequences. I wish you and your family the best of luck. I'm not just saying this because I'm incarcerated. I honestly mean every word. Love, Richard. Into the briefcase. Within days of his arrest, Richard's family scraped the money together to hire a private attorney to handle his defense. They chose Bill Dubois, a courtly 40-year-old veteran of the Alameda County Courthouse, who had represented a number of high-profile defendants, including one of the men who murdered the transgender teenager Gwen Araujo in 2002. At their first meeting, Richard gave Dubois two letters he'd handwritten to Sasha. The one he wrote on November 8th, and a second he wrote on November 11th. Dubois took the letters and tucked them away in his briefcase. Because the letters contained an admission of guilt, he felt he couldn't send them until the case was resolved. It would be 14 months before Sasha read them. Skirts for Sasha. On Friday, November 8th, everyone at Maybeck wore a skirt. Teachers, students, staff, even Healy, who didn't own any skirts, she used a pinafore that she'd worn as a costume in a play. Ian dressed as much like Sasha as he could manage in a skirt, knee socks, flat cap, and vest. Nemo wore a tartan skirt over jeans. Michael wore a black mini skirt along with his signature khaki jacket and gray beanie. A photo of Maybeck students holding a sign saying skirts for Sasha was taken by a photographer for the San Jose Mercury News and reposted to dozens of LGBTQ and anti-bullying blogs. A week later, under the light of a three-quarter moon, roughly 150 supporters, including students from both Maybeck and Oakland high schools, marched along the route of the 57 bus. The march started at the street corner where Richard and Lloyd had gotten on the bus the week before. Television cameras jockeyed for positions, nearly knocking each other over in their eagerness to get the best shot. The kids from Maybeck peered curiously at Oakland High School. Most of them had never seen it before. For a minute, there was a lot of anger toward Oakland High School at Maybeck, Michael recalls, but they were really good at distancing themselves from the guy who lit Sasha on fire. Drums beat in the background, keeping time with the thwop, thwop, thwop of the news helicopters overhead as the marchers tied rainbow ribbons to the bus stop poles between Ojai and the spot where Sasha usually got off. People carried balloons and glow sticks and signs that said, accept everyone and we're all Sasha. Get well, the sign said. We hecka love you, Sasha. The second letter. November 11th, 2013. Dear Mr. 
It's me again, Richard. I just wanted to say that I'm still very sorry and I hope you're getting better. I had a nightmare last night and I woke up sweating and apologizing. I really hope you get back to the way you were. I went to court yesterday and they're still making me seem like a monster, but I'm not. I'm a good kid if you just would if you get to know me. I'm sure you would have been a nice person too. I regret what I did. I didn't know that your clothing would catch like it did, even though I had no reason to do it anyways. I don't know what was going through my head. I've committed a stupid act of violence and I'm going to be punished for that. And I accept all consequences that I received because you didn't deserve this. I didn't even know you and I still don't. I was hoping that I can meet you face to face so I can apologize to you. I am being charged with great bodily injury and a hate crime. I accept the first charge, but the hate crime is wrong. I don't have a problem with homosexuals. I have friends that's homosexuals and one never had, and we never had problems. So I don't look at you wrong because of your sexuality. Honestly, I could care less if you like men. You wasn't trying to talk to me in that way. I just hope that you forgive me for the pain I brought you and your family. I am not a thug, gangster, hoodlum, nor monster. I'm a young African-American male who's made a terrible mistake. Not only did I hurt you, but I hurt your family and friends, and also my family and friends, for I have brought shame to them and our country, and I shall be punished, which is going to be hard for me because I am not made to be incarcerated. In the Bible, Jeremiah 1, 5, it says, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Consecrated means to dedicate somebody or something to a particular purpose. I'm not saying I'm a prophet. What I'm saying is God knows us before we were anything, and he made a plan for us all. And we know it's not evil because God isn't evil. So we wasn't made to do bad things. I really don't know why I did what I did, but I hope you don't think I'm evil. I'm actually good. I've also been hurt a lot for no reason. Not like I hurt you, but I've been hurt physically and mentally, so I know how it feels. The pain and confusion of why me. I felt it before plenty of times, so I know how it feels. So get better, and I'm looking forward to meeting you so I can apologize. I'm going to write you at least two letters a week, so be expecting them, and I'll keep you in my prayers. Get well, signed Richard. Let's take care of each other. Richard didn't end up writing more letters, but on November 11th, Carl wrote a letter of his own. It was sent to the parents and staff at Sequoia Elementary School where he taught kindergarten. I think it's really important to keep in mind that none of us can know the mind, motivations, or intentions of the person who set flame to Sasha's clothing, he wrote. Oakland police have a 16-year-old high school student in custody based on video camera footage from the bus. As far as I know, police are the only people who have viewed the footage. I certainly haven't, so I can only guess at what happened. At this point, I choose to assume that this kid was playing with fire and that he gravely underestimated the consequences of that. Others may make different assumptions, but it's important to remember that they are all just that, assumptions. So when I talk to my students about this, I will emphasize the importance of fire safety. Don't play with matches or lighters. And of course, stop, drop, and roll if your clothing catches fire. He also offered language for explaining Sasha's gender identity. Being a gender simply means that the person doesn't feel they are either a boy or a girl. I really realize this is a concept that even adults have difficulty wrapping their heads around. My wife and I frequently slip up in our pronoun usage, much to Sasha's chagrin. So I can't imagine that it's an issue. I can't pretend that it's an issue that all young children will grasp. But what they certainly can and should understand is that different people like different things. Different people dress or behave or look differently. And that's a good thing. Sasha feels comfortable wearing a skirt. It's part of their style. They also frequently sport a necktie and vest. Sasha likes the look. And frankly, so do I. 
it makes me smile to see Sasha being Sasha. As I wrote above, none of us can know the mind of the kid who lit a flame to Sasha's skirt. But I have a feeling that if he had seen Sasha's skirt as an expression of another kid's unique, beautiful self and had smiled and thought, I hella love Oakland, I wouldn't be writing this now. Again, many thanks for all of your love and kindness. Let's all take care of each other. Carl. Homophobic. Richard's extended family showed up for his second court appearance on November 15th, including Jasmine's cousin Regis, who is gay. Tall, attractive, and androgynous, Re Regis didn't talk to the press, but his presence was a statement in itself. I'm here, I'm queer, and I support my cousin. Inside the courtroom, reporters discussed the best terms to use when describing Sasha, gender fluid, gender queer, gender non-conforming, agender. I just say he was wearing a skirt, one reporter offered. He gave a weary shrug. The terms change all the time. Nothing much happened in court other than Dubois announcing his plans to file a motion contesting the decision to try Richard as an adult. Afterward, he took questions from reporters. I've met the minor and I can tell you he's not homophobic. Not even remotely, he said. First of all, he doesn't know how to spell homophobic, much less be it. Everyone had their own th theory as to why Richard had used the term. Dubois said when he asked Richard for a definition, Richard said that it meant he wasn't gay, that he liked girls. Jasmine said that she thought he was trying to get out of trouble by saying what he thought the police wanted him to say. But whatever his reason for saying it, it was part of the story now. Newscasters mentioned it almost every time they reported a new development. This is not a whodunit, Dubois said. This is not even a what happened. This is what frame of mind the kid had. The attorney tended to talk about the case with a mixture of calm and exasperation, as if his powers of incredulity had already been strained to the point of breaking. He argued that the views Richard expressed in the police interview were nothing more sinister than a kid being weirded out by the side of a boy in a skirt. They're putting him in the category of skinhead because he admitted to being homophobic, to being very homophobic, and they're saying, we take that as true. He bugged out his eyes and dropped his jaw to indicate how absurd this was. Lynchings, they're, they're hate crimes, he said. But the kid who thinks that wearing a skirt is anomalous and decides to play a prank is not committing a hate crime. What they sent. On Sasha's first full day in the hospital, a stranger dropped off a bouquet of silk flowers, three white roses, and four stalks of orange Chinese lanterns. A former burn victim herself, she knew that real flowers aren't allowed in the burn ward because of the risk in, of infection. That was the beginning. Within days, letters and packages began arriving at the hospital at Maybeck High School, at Debbie and Carl's house. An online medical fund set up by Sasha's cousin raised more than $31,000 in donations. What did I get today? Sasha asked each afternoon when Debbie and Carl arrived at the hospital with the day's mail. The answer was something surprising, was sometimes surprising. Strangers sent money in small bills, paper cranes, a soft blanket, Star Wars stickers, a drawing of a TARDIS from Doctor Who, a four-page play written in Spanish, a book of poems by E.E. E. Cummings. A friend from the live-action role-playing community sewed Sasha a skirt and matching vest. The East Bay Heritage Quilters sent a vibrant purple quilt. People from the Khan Lang community sent letters in their invented languages using beautiful calligraphy. People from Canada sent things with maple leaves on them. High school gay straight alliances from all over the country sent cards decorated with rainbows. The missives piled up. Handmade cards, store-bought cards, folded sheets of notebook paper, emails. They came from Colombia, Germany, France, Australia. Get well, they said. Be strong, be proud. You are beautiful the way you are. Sasha couldn't concentrate on any of it for long, but they liked knowing that so many people cared. 
Cards from Sasha's friends stayed in the hospital room. So did the bouquet of silk flowers. Everything else, Debbie and Carl took home. Over the next few weeks, Debbie would periodically type Sasha's name into Google to see how the story was being covered around the world. Once, the search led her to a neo-Nazi site. They were having a really hard time, she said. An African-American? Oh, evil. But then it's this trans kid wearing a shirt, or I mean a skirt. What? They couldn't figure out who to root against, Carl explained. He grinned. It was a really hard time for the neo-Nazi community. No hate. Nobody knew him. Nobody who knew him could believe it. Richard was a goofball, sure, but hateful? It just didn't make sense. It blew me back, Carlita Collins, the school security officer said. It blew my weave back to the fat part. Word was that Richard had set the skirt alight at the urging of another kid, got played, fell for the okie doke. I just couldn't understand why he would make such a childish mistake, Collins said. But then I thought about it like, oh, he's 16. But that wasn't how the rest of the school saw it. Richard had only been there two months and he didn't know too many people. For most students, all that mattered was that Ojai was in the news again and not for any of the good things that happened there. It was like nobody ever paid attention until somebody screwed up. He was black and he did that. Most of us that go here are black. We're expected to do something wrong, explains uh, America, who played on the football and baseball teams. People act like if you go to Ojai, that's the baddest school in Oakland. Since that happened, people just thought that all of us are basically the same. It was important to say no, to say that's not us. What are students? What our student allegedly did to Sasha is hideous and is not representative of the values we hold know to be true of the Oakland High community, Principal Mateen Abdil Kawi said in a letter he read over the school loudspeaker. We are all capable of doing what is right, even and especially when it seems impossible. We all have responsibility to stop acts of violence. The student body at Oakland High is extremely diverse. Our families come from all over the world. Wouldn't it be amazing if we led by example and showed Oakland what it means to respect and appreciate each other's differences? A movement sprouted on campus. No hate. Students and staff painted banners that said, Sasha, we stand with you. A student-led fundraiser collected more than 8,000, or no, I'm sorry, $800 for Sasha's medical bills. Students folded a long chain of paper cranes and sent it to Sasha. In December, Ojai's Wildcats basketball team played its first home game wearing blue jerseys with Sasha's name on the back and the words no hate on the front. The gymnasium was festooned with handmade posters in the blue and white Wildcats colors that said not in our school and stand up to hate. A number of the boys on the basketball team knew Richard, and they had come to practice after his arrest talking about what happened. Richard wasn't a bad kid, they said, just a follower. It seemed wrong that he might be locked up for life. But then one of the players pointed out that they should be thinking about the victim, too. What happened to Sasha was terrible. That shouldn't happen to anybody, he said. What if that had happened to somebody in your family? That was when the team decided to order jerseys that stood up for Sasha. We're against hate and bullying, basketball coach Orlando Watkins said when the team gathered in the locker room before the game wearing their no hate jerseys. <clears throat> this is a big game for us today, not just because we need the victory, but it represents something bigger than just basketball. So let's go out there today. Let's play hard. Let's stay focused and let's take care of business. The team listened somberly, then gathered in a circle. No hate on me. No hate on three, team captain Keith called. One, two, three. No hate. Y'all don't know. Caprice found it hard to go to school. In her time in the Oakland schools, she'd seen plenty of kids drop out or get kicked out, get shot or get pregnant. But Richard was supposed to be different. I can't even hardly express the feelings I have because I knew where he was trying to go, she says. I knew he would be the one graduating from here. The no hate banners were everywhere. 
but no one was talking about Richard. Abdel Kawi, the school principal, had concluded the letter he read over the loudspeaker by reminding students to show our student currently in custody, compassion and tolerance. But Richard's friends felt that this last bit had gotten plastered over by the reams of no hate posters. One by one, they showed up in Caprice's office to complain. They said it was a hate crime, but he had family that wasn't straight, Richard's friend Liddell said. We were with no hate, but in Richard's case, it wasn't hate. What he did was wrong, as like a joke, playful. It was like a funny little prank joke turns to something that ends your whole life. To Liddell, it just seemed like the outside world didn't grasp how easy it was for kids who grew up in poor neighborhoods to take that wrong turn. People have different habitats, he explained. Some people have it better than others. They grew up in good neighborhoods. Their family has jobs. They have good income. They don't understand. Their life is so good, they think everybody's life is good. They don't understand the struggles people go through. I don't know where you grew up at, if it's like a low income area where there's lots of violence and crime, but if you grew up in a low income area and all you see is crime and drugs, if you have family that does crime, you see it. It has an impact on you. If you're around it a lot, it's hard to do good. It just hurt, Cherie said. Somebody you know are that close to and it becomes all like viral, she shook her head. People would say all types of stuff, like he was just intentionally trying to burn him, like, oh yeah, he's gay, he's hecka gay, let's burn him. I'm not saying what he did was right. I'm just saying at the end of the day, he was 16. You're all just trying to put an opinion on something that you don't know. Y'all don't know. The circle. Each day that the no hate organi organizing at Oakland High School went on, Richard's friends grew increasingly upset. Finally, Caprice went to Principal Abdal Kawi to ask if she could hold a restorative justice circle so that Richard's friends could share their feelings. She invited Amy Wilder, an Oakland High School resource specialist who was the faculty advisor for the school's Gay Straight Alliance. Wilder, who majored in gender studies in college, had been working with students to show support for Sasha. About a dozen students gathered in a circle in an empty classroom a few days later. Most of them didn't really know each other. Richard was the one thing they had in common. The facilitator passed around a green race car that served as a talking piece. When the race car reached you, it was your turn to speak. Otherwise, you listened. The first few times the race car went around the circle, the questions were playful. If you were a superhero, what would your superpower be? Questions that led them, questions that let them get to know one another a lot, a bit. Then they talked about Richard, how silly he was and how kind and how he'd had a friend and a family member who were gay. One of them passed around a photo of Richard on a cell phone. When the phone reached Wilder, she gave a start of recognition. It was Richard's eyes, she remembered, his hazel eyes. Early in the year, a parent had come in to meet with her and had brought along a younger sibling. The kid was wild, out of control. No way were they going to be able to have a conversation with this kid bouncing off the walls. But then Richard had come out of Caprice's office. He went over to the kid and somehow calmed him down, got him focused so the meeting could take place. Now, as she stared at Richard's picture, Wilder's eyes filled with tears. Because he was so sweet, she explained, and he's such a young person facing such serious consequences. When she shared that, it was huge, Caprice said afterward. It was incredible. We could hardly take it. All they had wanted was someone else to understand. Skinned. Five days after the second surgery, Sasha returned to the operating room where Dr. Grossman's team used a tool called a dermatome to harvest three inch wide strips of skin from Sasha's back. After removing each strip, Dr. Grossman passed it through a meshing device that perforated it with tiny holes so that it could be stretched to cover a larger area. Then he placed it over Sasha's wounds and stapled it into place. Peel, mesh, place, staple. Peel, mesh, place, staple. 
When it was over, the burn sites were covered with new skin, but Sasha's back was raw, exposed. The pain was intense, more intense than the burns had been. It was as if they had been burned or skinned alive. God is good. The ladies seemed to materialize out of nowhere. There were three of them at the third court hearing on November 26th. Older white women who dressed as chastely as nuns in turtlenecks and blazers and sensible shoes. They came, they said, because they were concerned about Richard. Not that it's not a horrible crime, one explained, but it's also a crime to try a child as an adult. Inside the courtroom, defendants appeared in a small box to the left of the judge. It was possible to see them only if you sat on the far right side of the gallery and pressed your cheek against the wall. By the third hearing, the reporters had figured this out and they all squished into the same column of seats, leaning into one another to get a glimpse of Richard's face. Jasmine wore glossy pink lipstick, black leggings, and a t-shirt that said Los Angeles. Her face was bright, eager, confident. She knew it would all turn out okay. God is good, she repeated to herself in the elevator. God is good. God is so good. You look nice, her cousin Regis said as the family gathered in the hallway waiting for Dubois to be done talking to reporters. I like your hair. His own hair was gorgeous, streaked red and gold with hair extensions he'd made himself. He was dressed stylishly in a gold jacket, tight jeans, a scarf, and lace-up boots. There, they were an attractive trio, he and Jasmine, and Jasmine's sister, Juliet. As they waited for Richard's lawyer to give them an update, they talked about what they were cooking for Thanksgiving just two days away. Macaroni and cheese, yams, that spinach dip they loved. Conversation turned to a case that was in the news. Donald Williams Jr., an African-American freshman at San Jose State University, had been relentlessly bullied by the white students he lived with in a four-bedroom dormitory suite. The white kids, also freshmen, had insisted on calling Williams three-fifths, a reference to the clause in the original U.S. Constitution that counted slaves as three-fifths of a person when determining population for representation in Congress. They clamped a bike lock around his neck and claimed to have lost the key. They draped a Confederate flag over a cardboard cutout of Elvis Presley in the suite's living room. They locked him in his room and they claimed it was all just a series of good-natured pranks. In the end, three 18-year-old white students were expelled for what they did to Williams and a 17-year-old was suspended. The three who were expelled were also charged in criminal court. The charge, misdemeanor battery with a hate crime enhancement, which carried a maximum penalty of a year and a half in county jail. A jury eventually convicted all three of battery, but acquitted one of the students of the hate crime charge and deadlocked on the others. Girl, they got misdemeanors, Regis said. Nobody got charged with any felonies. Three white boys on one black boy. <clears throat> Does it have to be me? Sasha was released from the hospital the next day, 23 days after the fire. Reporters lined the street in front of Sasha's house, pushing up against the front door. News helicopters circled. Sasha gave an interview to the local news wearing a skirt over bandaged legs. I was really excited that an agender person was in the news, they said later, but I wasn't that excited about the circumstances, obviously. Those were my feelings. This is really great, but does it have to be me? Sasha also suspected that not everyone understood what the story was all about. I got the idea that it wasn't really about me being agender, they said. A lot of the news coverage was a boy was wearing a skirt rather than an agender person was wearing a skirt. And that kind of bugged me that I was being misrepresented in that way. Back at Maybeck. Sasha returned to school in December on the Monday after the Thanksgiving break. They were eager to be back after the long, boring days in the hospital and they dressed a little smarter than usual, matching the flat cap and skirt with the vest, bow tie and crisp white shirt. The press was there, of course, craning to get a view of Sasha, like paparazzi angling for a shot of the royal family. 
Sasha's friends made a point of not making a big deal about Sasha's return, and they asked their classmates to do the same. They knew Sasha hated being the center of attention. So after greeting them with hugs, they tried to be chill. As chill as you can be with a line of news trucks idling in front of your school antennas stabbing the sky. There were so many cameras at the school and they were like, are you Sasha's friend? Can we talk to you? Taya remembers. And that was a little weird because I didn't know how to approach my friendship with Sasha. I don't think Sasha wanted to be around their friends with their friends thinking I'm talking to a famous person or I'm talking to somebody that something horrible happened to. They just wanted things to be normal. It really distanced me from the friendship, which is a shame. After school, Sasha went to ballroom dance club. Taya was crazy about ballroom dancing, so she'd started the club and Sasha, Nemo and Michael had joined. Sasha and Nemo were careful no, they were useful additions because they could dance either the male or the female part, depending on what was needed. That first day back, Sasha waltzed with Michael as their partner. Michael noticed that his friend was quieter than they'd been before, a little more inward. But overall, Sasha seemed okay. Worst days ever. There were a lot more of them now. Worst days, worst nights the days their legs itched from the graft, from their leg hairs getting caught in the bandages, a prickly irritation that never stopped, the days their legs ached when everything that used to be normal was suddenly difficult, showering, seated now, using a handheld shower, getting dressed, both legs had to be wrapped in three layers of bandages, going to school, they were so tired, just so very tired, the nights after getting home from the hospital when they felt like they had to pee all the time but couldn't, a side effect of having had a urinary catheter in for all those weeks in the hospital. The nights when sleep felt like a distant cousin they'd met long ago but didn't know well enough to talk to. The nights they took Percocet for the pain and it made them hyper instead of sleepy. They tried not to think about the fire or the person who said it but sometimes it was hard not to wonder why, not to just feel incredulous that this was the situation. One minute you're on your way home from school and then it's an ambulance and a hospital and surgery and pain and painkillers and band bandages and seated showers. It was just like, how is this a thing that happens? Reunion. Dan Gale sat in a wicker chair in Sasha's living room beside his cousin Russell, taking deep nervous breaths and exhaling through his teeth. It was a Saturday in early December and Dan had been invited to join Sasha's family for brunch. Russell came along for support. The past few weeks had been a whirlwind for Dan. Whirlwind for Dan. A month ago, he'd been an ordinary guy, a construction worker who did some extra work on the side at a friend's t-shirt shop. Then he'd taken the bus home from work one day and helped save the life of a teenager whose skirt was on fire. Suddenly, he was a hero, a good Samaritan. He'd been honored at City Hall, featured on the news. Police Chief Sean Wendt had said that Dan's actions on the bus had proved that despite Oakland's reputation for crime, there are good people all over the city. Even his own family looked at him with a newfound respect. Now Dan was about to see Sasha for the first time since that day on the bus, but it was taking Sasha a while to come out of their bedroom. They have to put their stockings on over the scars, Debbie explained. There are, these are a few spots, there are a few spots that still have to be bandaged, but they're healing pretty well. That's great, Dan said, his expression grave. He was in his early 50s and had basset hound, brown, brown eyes, a thick salt and pepper mustache, and a deep gravelly voice. He crossed and uncrossed his neat legs, resting one of his white tennis shoes on one knee. Beside him, Russell, who owned the construction company where Dan worked, blinked sleepily, a three-day beard peppering his cheeks. The two of them surveyed the living room, which was cozy and cluttered, its surfaces covered with house plants, magazines, dried flowers, and framed photographs, its shelves overflowing with hardback books and board games, its limited floor space crammed with musical instruments, a piano, two guitars, a bongo drum. 
a paper banner inscribed with get well messages wrapped nearly all the way around the room, a souvenir from the march along the 57 bus route the previous month. At last, Sasha came in wearing a gray hoodie and a black skirt, legs swaddled in white bandages. Dan sucked in a breath. Oh, wow, he whispered. He stood and en enveloped Sasha in a hug. How are you doing, man? I'm doing good, Sasha blinked a few times, grinning shyly. You look great. Yeah, I'm not feeling too bad. That's great. Don't change who you are, dude. Don't change, Dan shook his head. This is weird. Awkward. His eyes brimmed with tears. I'm sorry, dude. I'm, I'm really sorry, he croaked, a voice breaking. Thanks for all you did, Carl said, coming into the room behind Sasha. Man, I'm sorry I couldn't have done more. Dan turned to Sasha. It was hard to get to you. You did all you could, Sasha said. You did the best. But Dan had already moved on to the future. He wanted to accompany Sasha on their return to the bus. I want to be there, he insisted, insisted. I mean, you're my friend now, forever. Because of you, because of this whole situation, I feel real better about myself. I have a better relationship with my daughters and stuff. I'm sorry for what happened to you, but man, I benefited big time out of it. He laughed, and to his evident relief, everyone joined in. The conversation moved in fits and spurts, lapsing into awkward pauses and then reigniting again. Sasha told Dan about using the fire to full advantage. I can't do the dishes. My legs get injured. My legs got injured. I can't help with dinner. My legs. I can't do my homework. Legs. Dan talked about how he'd seen Sasha on the bus for years, always with a book in hand. The kid's smarter than anybody on the bus combined. Than everybody on the bus combined, he announced. Then he turned back to Sasha. That's because of your parents, you know. Remember this. All your life, you're going to want your parents off your back. Then you realize when you get older, they're the ones that had your back. You had my back, Sasha said. Dan shut his eyes for a moment. You know, I turned around and I saw the fire, he said. And my first reaction was, oh, I can do this. I got this. 20 years earlier, he explained, he'd been with a friend who was driving a car at a demolition derby. The friend had been working on the car when he mistook a container of gasoline for a container of water and tried to use it to douse a spark. When Dan saw his friend go up in flames, he tackled him and put him out. Who'd ever imagine it was a skill he'd need to use a second time? Over breakfast, a tofu scramble for Sasha, eggs and pastries for everyone else, the conversation turned to the kid who'd set Sasha on fire. Debbie and Carl had told reporters that they wanted to see Richard tried as a juvenile, not as an adult. I think you guys are a lot more lenient about what you want to see than I would be, Dan said. Mostly it's just, we don't know, Carl explained. They didn't want to be the ones to decide what would happen to Richard. They didn't feel like they had enough information. I'll leave it to other people to figure out. Dan turned to Sasha. How do you feel on that? I mean, this kid hurt you. Sasha considered this. I know he hurt me. He did something that's really dangerous and stupid. But then again, he's a 16-year-old kid, and 16-year-old kids are kind of dumb. It's really hard to know what I want for him.
They wrote nigger on a whiteboard 